Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another study in systematic theology. Today, we're looking at the doctrine of ecclesiology. Ecclesiology comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means the called out ones or the assembly. It also comes from the Hebrew word kahal, which means the assembly. Now, in terms of the New Testament church, church can mean a local body of believers. It can mean a group of churches that are working collectively. For example, Paul writes to the churches in Galatia. He's not writing to one church, but to multiple churches of his geographic region. A church can also mean the universal church, such as all believers in heaven and on earth that constitute the entire body of Christ. Now, in terms of the distinctives of the church, some of the things we need to keep in mind are these. First, it's made up of believers. Luke writes over in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they, that is the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And that was what the early church began to do, and that set the model for how all churches uh, should engage in the activities with which they do when they come to meet together. Uh, so in addition to being made up to believers, the other distinctive of the church is that it has ordinances, specifically baptism and the Lord's Supper. When it comes to baptism, there are a couple of different views on baptism. There are some who believe that infants can be baptized. Uh, this is based upon the argument of what we find in the Old Testament in terms of circumcision. As circumcision was a sign of the Old Covenant, uh, baptism is a sign of the New Covenant. The logic goes like this, since infants were circumcised according to the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant sign, therefore infants should be baptized in the New Covenant. The argument from history, which is sometimes made in terms of why we should baptize infants, is that the early church did it. If the early church did it, therefore we should do it as well, so it is argued. And then finally, the argument uh, from Scripture, when it was actually an argument from silence, would be that in many cases households were baptized. As such, it is reasoned that surely there must have been some infants that were in these households who were also baptized uh, with the rest of the family members. So that's one view, that infants can be baptized. The other view is the view that only believers should be baptized. That is, only those who have made a public profession of faith uh, should be baptized. Uh, we see this based upon the argument and order of Scripture. Uh, for example, Peter, over in Acts chapter 2, as he's giving his Pentecost sermon address, says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, or because of, the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he's talking about water baptism there for those who repent, that is, change their thinking about Christ and believe and trust in Him as uh, the Messiah. And over in Acts chapter 16, Luke writes, and he took them that very hour of night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and said, set food before them and rejoiced greatly. Why? Having believed in God with his whole household. And so we see then that those who are baptized here are those who have believed or trusted in Christ. So there are some who say, uh, infants can be baptized. There are others who follow the believers only baptism. We also see an example of a rebaptism, and that is there are disciples of John the Baptist who come into contact with Paul. Now, these disciples were earlier baptized by John, and they were later baptized after Paul presented the gospel to them with the result that they believed. They were then baptized into the baptism of Christ. Now, sometimes the question is asked, in terms of baptism as to why was Jesus baptized? In other words, if he was the perfect son of God, uh, even John said, you should be baptizing me, uh, not me baptizing you. Uh, MacArthur, I think, rightly notes that Jesus' act of baptism was uh, necessary uh, to fulfill the righteousness he secured for sinners. 
this first public event of his ministry is also rich in meaning. And he lists four things. It is pictured by his death and resurrection. It is prefigured the significance of Christian baptism. It marked his first public identification with those whose sins he would bear. And it was a public affirmation of his messiahship by testimony directly from heaven. Uh, we know that when he came up out of the water that the Spirit of God descended on him as a dove. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So he did this to fulfill all righteousness to, and to be obedient. Uh, because this was going to be something that would be credited to the life of every believer who believes and trusts in him. So that's one ordinance of the church, baptism. The other ordinance of the church is the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in connection with eating the Passover meal in the upper room with the disciples. The ordinance consisted of Christ taking the unleavened bread, giving thanks and giving it to his disciples, telling them that this is, was his body which was being broken for them. And then he did the same thing with the cup, uh, that this would be the wine or his blood which was uh, poured out for them. What he's doing here is instituting the new covenant which would be ratified when he died upon the cross the following day. As such, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, we need to keep in mind that it is a remembrance of Christ in that it represents his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but more than that, it's also an assurance of his second coming. For he tells the disciples that he would not eat with them until the coming kingdom. That is, he would not eat with them in the terms of the Lord's Supper until the coming kingdom. It is also a time of fellowship with Christ and his people. So it's a time of celebration as we remember that Christ will come again one day and receive us unto himself. There is a stipulation or a warning, if you will, in that we do not partake of the Lord's table in an irreverent manner. To do so, one eats and drinks judgment to himself. The Apostle Paul says that we need to evaluate ourselves and that we need to judge our thoughts, our words, our motives rightly and to make sure that there's nothing that hinders our fellowship with God uh, because if it does we run the risk of falling under some form of temporal discipline that's why Paul will tell the Christians in 1 Corinthians 11 for this that is among the church are weak are sick and he says a number sleep that means a number have physically died and he says, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged, that is, by God's temporal judgment. So whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, we must keep in mind that only believers have the capacity to rightly judge themselves. An unbeliever does not have the capacity to do that. Why? Because they're spiritually dead, they're alienated from God, and they do not have the capacity to know and discern spiritual truth, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Therefore, that would conclude that only believers then should be one of the ones who are participating and celebrating the Lord's table. So those are the two ordinances of the church. Uh, in addition to the distinctives of the church being made up of believers and having specific ordinances, the church also maintains a level of organization, uh, leadership, and discipline. For example, uh, there are more than this. But I'm going to talk about two that are most prevalent in our country today and in terms of church government. And the first is the federal form of church government. Now, that is not to be confused with the federal government of the United States. Uh, what it means is that simply in this system of government, uh, individual churches surrender a certain level of denominational authority to a higher government, uh, such as an assembly or a synod, which is actually a, a form of church council. Uh, some of the denominations that participate in this kind of church government are Presbyterians, uh, the Methodist denomination, uh, many Pentecostal churches, and some of our Christian reform churches. They participate in this kind of church government. The other kind of church government that we're probably more familiar with is the congregational form of government. In this system of church government, ultimate authority rests with the members of each individual church. 
In other words, there's not a council that presides over a body of churches. Each church is local and it is autonomous, meaning that if it does cooperate with other organizations, it does so voluntarily uh, and not under compulsion. Um, most of the, or all of the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention have this type of cooperation with the SBC. Uh, the SBC does not provide oversight, and by SBC I'm referring to the Southern Baptist Convention, does not provide oversight for local autonomous bodies, but it is merely an organization with which these local bodies uh, voluntarily participate to accomplish the mission of the church. Now, in terms of church offices, what we see historically is that there are three offices in the church. The first being the, that of the apostles. This is something that we don't have today in the church <clears throat> with a capital A, apostles, uh, because this was someone who was specifically sent or commissioned to be a representative for Christ. So in order to be an apostle, one had to be specifically called by Christ himself uh, for example, in Luke chapter 6, Luke writes, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, that is Jesus, and he spent the whole night in his prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples, that is his followers, to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. So these are specific individuals that Jesus is calling out. So they had to be called by him specifically. They secondly had to be a witness to the resurrection of Christ. This is something that's determined over in Acts chapter 1 after Judas commits suicide. Two individuals are up for replacing Judas. This is what we find over in Acts chapter 1 as two individuals are set, one of which will be replacing Judas. Uh, and one of the stipulations for whoever it will be is that they had to be a witness to the resurrection. And we know ultimately Matthias is the one who, uh, who replaced Judas. And then third, the, uh, the apostles had to demonstrate the acts of an apostle or signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. Again, there are no apostles today because the foundation has already been laid. Uh, so we move then to the second office of the church, and that is the office of elder. Uh, the first mention of the word elder in the New Testament is found over in Acts chapter 11. Uh, since it is not defined as to the function or form of what an elder does, uh, we may conclude that there was already a clear understanding of the position of elder based upon the Old Testament understanding that elders were men who exercised great maturity and wisdom and leadership and they had a deep understanding of the Word of God. Now, the New Testament uses two words uh, for the office of elder, the first being elder itself, presbyteros, and the other word is that of episkopos, which is normally translated bishop or overseer. These terms are used synonymously in the New Testament. What we find is that the word elder appears to emphasize the maturity of the man, while the term bishop or overseer emphasizes the function of the office. For example, when we look at the qualifications of an elder, we find this over in 1 Timothy 3 and over in Titus. Uh, Paul is the author of both of these. Uh, he says, if someone wants to become an elder, it is a good work. So uh, there's no specific call, meaning uh, one is not say, hey, I think, God has called me to this, and so that's not a stipulation to be an elder, uh, but rather, Paul says, anyone who has the desire to do so. Now, we may say that God will grant the person the desire to do so, uh, and then he will go on to say that an elder uh, must have certain moral qualifications. Um, in addition to the moral qualifications, he must be the husband of one wife, which restricts the office of elder or overseer to men. Um, and then Paul lists these other uh, moral qualifications. In addition to these qualifications, their duties appear to consist of leading the church, that they are teachers in the church, that their function is to protect the church from doctrinal and practical errors, and they are to provide the general oversight and administration 
of all of the churches. In terms of the uh, qualifications, uh, sometimes a debate arises in terms of uh, wanting to know how many elders should a church have. Uh, there's, uh, should a church have many elders or is the rule that the church is only has one elder? Scripturally speaking, whenever we see elders being mentioned in the church, they're always used in the plurality, meaning multiple elder, elders. Uh, the only case that we can find for the single elder being used is when Paul is listing that as a qualification. Uh, in other words, when he's listing the qualifications of the elder, he uses the term in the singular. Uh, so it's a generic reference to elder as a type. Moreover, since the local synagogue set the pattern for the New Testament church, what we may conclude is that of all of the New Testament churches, they had a plurality of elders and not just a single elder rule church. And then the third office is that of deacon, diakonos, which means servant. Uh, the first prototype that we see for deacons in the church appears to come to us from Acts chapter 6. Here what we have is a debate arising, conflict arising between Hellenistic Jews and native Hebrew Jews in terms of the serving of food to the widows. Uh, they brought this issue to the apostles and the apostles reasoned that, you know, they didn't have the time to uh, settle this type of di dispute or discussion because they were busy preaching and teaching and uh, so forth. And so they uh, admonished the church to select men from among them who were full of the spirit and wisdom and grace to serve the body. And that's what happened. That's where uh, Stephen, the first deacon, I guess you could call the prototype for deacons, uh, was established here in this passage. In terms of the duties of deacons, we see that they served food there for that early church, but there's not really um, duties listed in terms of their exact function in the churches. So what we may conclude from that is there's a lot of flexibility in their range of service for what they may do for the body of Christ. The only difference in terms of their qualifications that distinguishes them from the elders is the fact that the elder must have the ability to teach, and this is not a requirement for someone who is a deacon. <clears throat> so in terms of church distinctives then, we can say that it's made up of believers, that it has two ordinances, that it maintains a level of type of organization and leadership, and finally, that the church exists to do God's will, uh, meaning uh, that the church exists to worship, to give, to evangelize, and to engage in discipleship. The worship of our church then consists of individual worship, it consists of corporate worship, public worship, and private acts of service for the Lord. All of this is generated by a reverence for and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is totally worthy of our worship and praise. This, beloved, is the basis for why we do what we do as the church. Jesus said in Matthew 28 that our mission is to go forth and make disciples of all of the people of the nations that we are to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that we are to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. That is our mission. The question that we have to ask ourselves is how well are we completing that mission? Are we trying to reach the nations? Mahatma Gandhi, who was an Indian guru, was studying religion when he was a student. He studied various kinds of religions, and he also studied Christianity. On one occasion, he sought to go into the church when he was met by the usher of a westernized church there in India. An usher was standing at the door when Gandhi approached, and he looked down at Gandhi and said, why don't you go worship with your own people? Gandhi turned around thinking as that young student, if Christians have a caste system too, I might as well remain a Hindu. Think about what could have happened had that 
usher, welcomed him into the church, brought him down and shared with him the love of Christ. What could possibly could have been. Beloved, we need to be careful about our mission. We need to be careful about our witness. We need to be busy reaching out to the world. We need to be busy doing exactly what Christ said, which is we need to be teaching and baptizing and we need to be loving people. That's really what church is all about. That's really the highest expression of who God is, that we demonstrate love for our fellow man. We do so by sharing the gospel with them. We do so by meeting their needs. This is what it means to be the church. Join us next time as we continue our study of systematic theology.